After our discussion of the operational amplifier and the analysis of some circuits that use the op amp and also some uh, limitations of the op amp, um, what we will start with now is to look at what's, what's inside the op amp. Let's consider a um, very simple CMOS operation amplifier. And this is how it, it looks like uh, from the inside. <clears throat> um, a circuit with MOSFETs. Um, <clears throat> we can count eight MOSFETs. There's a reference current source in there. That's probably implemented using more transistors and resistors. And there is a capacitor. So this input here of the up amp is the uh, input with the minus. It's called the inverting input. This would be here. This input, the non-inverting with the plus sign would be here. The output would be here. And the supplies are the positive supply and the negative supply. So this is node number four and node number five. So inside the blue triangle, which is the op amp, I have a circuit with the, all these MOSFETs. Now let's look at the sub circuits inside the circuit. If you can see the colors, I have a sub-circuit which is colored in yellow, a sub-circuit which is colored in light blue, and a sub-circuit which is colored in light brown or orange. Looking at the light blue sub-circuit, which is this part, This actually is a, if you just focus on this sub-circuit, this is something that we're familiar with. This is actually a, a current mirror. The current here, I, flowing in Q5, is mirroring IREF. And Q5 <coughs> and Q8 implement the current mirror. That's a current mirror. I'm generating a current here I, which is IRF times the ratio of the W over Ls. I can also say the same about the current here, because also Q7 gate is connected to this node and Q7 is therefore also mirroring IRF. So we've, we've seen such circuits before. This is a current mirror. The blue, the lighter blue is a current mirror. And also Q7 is an extension of this current mirror. What about the yellow sub-circuit, this one here? So we already identified Q7 as mirroring the current IRF. What about Q6? Q6 is a MOSFET with input coming here and output taken here. So it's, its input is at the gate and its output is at the drain. Its source is at signal ground. And this is like a current mirror mirroring IRF here. So this means that this is a common source amplifier where the input is coming from the orange sub-circuit is being amplified by Q6 and I take the output from here. And in the drain of Q6, between the drain of Q6 and the supply, I have Q7 acting as a current source mirroring IRF. 
So the yellow subcircuit is therefore a common source amplifier. And the lighter blue is a current mirror. So these are subcircuits that we're familiar with, but the subcircuit in the middle, this is something new. Um, we haven't seen this subcircuit before, and this is what we'll study uh, next. Uh, this is called a differential amplifier. And the reason we need a differential amplifier is because in the op amp, I always amplify uh, the difference between the potential at node two and the potential at node one. And I need to have very large gain. So I need a circuit therefore that will take two inputs and produce an output which is proportional to their difference and will give me some gain with that. And then I will need more gain to get very, very large gain overall. So how can I build a circuit using transistors, MOSFET or BJT that will take two inputs and produce an output which is proportional to their difference? I would need that inside the op amp. And this is the topic that we will discuss next. How can I take transistors, connect them and build a, a circuit that would amplify the difference between two inputs. So I don't have, now I don't have the op amp as a building block and I can use it to build a difference amplifier. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm actually building the op amp itself. So how can I implement this difference operator inside the op amp using transistors? So it's not too hard. Here's a simple MOSFET differential amplifier. And you can see here that I have two inputs. This is the first input. So VI1 is my first input source. Here's the second input. So the two inputs are connected to gates of two MOSFETs, Q1 and Q2. The sources of the two MOSFETs are connected together. So this is the node at which the two sources of the MOSFETs connect. And there is a current source, I, between this common, so, common node and the negative supply. This is the drain of the first MOSFET, and this is where I can take the first output. This is the drain of the second MOSFET, and, where, and this is where I can take the second output. So I can also have two outputs if I want to. And then between the drain of Q1 and the supply, there is a resistor RD between the drain of Q2 and the supply, there is a resistor RD and the two resistors are equal. And very important to have identical MOSFETs here. So Q1 and Q2 are identical, RD and RD are equal. All right, so let's, let's think about the circuit when, the, when VI1 and VI2 are zero, let's say, this is zero, nothing. I ground the two inputs, zero and zero. Looking at this circuit with the two inputs at zero, zero, with Q1 and Q2 identical, RD and RD the same, connected to the same supply VDD, the two sources of the two MOSFETs are connected together and they share this I current source. Well, I have perfect symmetry here, perfect symmetry. There is nothing on the left that is different from what's on the right. Perfect symmetry in the circuit. What does this mean? It means that if I have a current here, which is the drain current in Q1, and a current here, which is the drain current in Q2, 
due to the perfect symmetry, these two currents must be equal. There's nothing that says that one of the currents should be greater than the other or less. The circuit is very, very symmetrical. All right, so this current is ID1 and this current is ID2 and due to the symmetry, ID1 must be equal to ID2. And due to KCL, KCL tells me that the sum of the two should be I. So here I have two currents that must be equal and the sum of the two currents should be I. This implies that ID1 will be I over two and ID2 would be I over two. So the current flowing in Q1 would be one half I and the current flowing in Q2 would be one half I. That makes sense due to symmetry. The total is I, the circuit is symmetrical. One half would be on the left and the other half would be on the right. Okay. Let's say VI1 and VI2 are not zero. So uh, let's say VI1 is uh, 0 0.7 and VI2 is 0 0.7. VI1 is 0 0.7 volt and VI2 is 0 0.7 volt. What happens? Um, Again, looking at the circuit, I can repeat the exact same argument I just made and say that I still have perfect symmetry here and therefore the two currents must be equal. And since their sum is I, ID1 and ID2 would be equal to I over two. So even though VI1 and VI2 are no longer ground, they're 0.7 volt now, uh, the current will be the same. Okay. Let's consider maybe a negative voltage, let's say minus 0.5 and 0.5. Minus 0.5, minus 0.5. If VI1 is minus 0.5, VI2 is minus 0.5, what happens? Again, using the same argument, the perfect symmetry is still maintained and the two currents will be equal and they will be equal to I over two. Fine. What if I apply a non-DC voltage? Let's say this is sine omega T. And this is sine omega T. Sine omega t, sine omega t. These are sine waves now. Now the, the two inputs are, the, are are changing with time. They go up to one and then back to zero and then minus one back to zero, one minus one, one minus one, forever. What happens to the currents? Again, something surprising. The two currents have to be equal because of the symmetry. Even though the two inputs are, are sine omega t changing with time, the perfect symmetry is still maintained. I still have perfect symmetry, which means that ID1 should be equal to ID2, all right? And their sum should be I. And this means that ID1 is equal to I over two and ID2 is equal to I over two. Interesting, now let's look at this voltage. If this current here is I over two, what is VO1? It is VDD minus R I over two. And this is a DC voltage. This is a constant resistance and this is a DC current. So this voltage here VO1 would be pure DC. Even though the input is a sine wave, the output is pure DC. And the two sine waves, there's a question about the sine waves. The two sine waves are equal and in phase, sine omega t and sine omega t are equal. Uh, so, so this means that the circuit does not feel, does not 
recognize that there is something happening at the inputs. There is a sine wave at the input and the circuit is just ignoring it. Why does it ignore it? Because it's the same sine wave at the two inputs. So what if it's a triangular wave, maybe sine wave is special. So let's apply a triangular wave here and the same triangular wave here. What happens now? The exact same thing. I over two would be flowing in Q1 and I over two would be flowing in Q2 because VI1 is equal to VI2. Whether they're DC, whether if, if there is zero, positive, negative, sine wave, triangular wave, square wave, whatever kind of voltage you apply at the inputs. If the two inputs are equal, the currents in the two MOSFETs would be equal. And because of KCL, they have to be equal to I over two. So they will be pure DC and the output voltage will be pure DC, which means that the circuit does not amplify, does not feel the input. If the input is a signal, if you consider the input to be a signal, the circuit is, uh, does not feel this, does not see it. Because if you look at the output, if you look at the current in the circuit, if you look at the output voltage, they're completely ignoring the input. They're pure DC. So we, we say that this circuit is rejecting the signal at the two inputs if the two inputs are equal. Whenever the two inputs are equal, the circuit does not react. So because Q1 and Q2 are identical, and as long as VI1 is equal to VI2, VO1 would be equal to VO2 equal to VDD minus RDI over two, which is fixed pure DC. So no dependence of output on the inputs when the two inputs are equal. Is this a good result? Actually it is. If I'm trying to build a difference amplifier or differential amplifier, I want to amplify the difference. I want the circuit to react when there is a difference between the two inputs. If I want to build an amplifier that reacts to VI1 minus VI2, the differential amplifier should give me some gain times the difference. Then this circuit is doing the right thing. If I'm building a difference amplifier, the output should be proportional to this. And if the two inputs are equal, the output should be zero. No signal at the output. And this is exactly what the circuit is doing. If the two inputs are equal, this will go to zero and I, I don't see any signal at the output. So that's good. That's actually a good result. But so this is necessary, but not sufficient. Why is it not sufficient? Because I need to show that the same circuit with the two MOSFETs and the resistors would amplify a difference if it exists. I, I only showed that it will reject the inputs if they're equal. But what if they're not equal? Would it amplify? We would have to show that it does in fact amplify. And then we say, okay, we, we built a differential amplifier. Before we show how it amplifies, let's look at the BJT version. It's very similar to the MOSFET version. But instead of two MOSFETs, I have two bipolar transistors, Q1 and Q2. The first input is at the base of Q1. The second input is at the base of Q2. The outputs are taken from the collectors. The two resistors RC and RC are equal, connected to the same supply VCC. The two emitters of the transistors are connected together to a current source I. And um, the two, of course, the two transistors must be identical, perfect matching between them. And if this is the case, then um, I can use the same argument. I have perfect symmetry whenever VI1 is equal to VI2. And therefore this current would be I over two and this current would be I over two. 
And, um, and the, the only difference in this case is the collected current in the BJT when, uh, of course, these have to be in the active region because I'm building an amplifier, would be alpha times I emitter, so alpha times I over two, not I over two. But alpha is very, very close to one anyway. So alpha I over two, alpha I over two. But again, the output voltage would not feel anything if the two inputs are equal. The output voltage will be independent of the two inputs if they're equal. So when the two inputs are equal, VI1 is equal to VI2. This implies that VO1 is equal to VO2, equal to VCC minus RC times alpha I over two. So uh, the, the output voltage would be just a pure DC voltage independent of the two inputs. So same behavior, the circuit would not react, would reject the input if the two, the two inputs are equal, if the same signal appears at the two inputs. So this shows the first part that the circuit would reject equal inputs. Now, we, we also need to show that the circuit would amplify a difference. So here's the circuit when the two inputs are equal. Let's, let's write some equations. Let's start with some equations when the inputs are equal. So back to the MOSFET case, the input here and the input here are uh, called now VG1 and VG2 and they're equal. So this is the case when they are equal and we call that VCM, common mode. If the two inputs are equal to VCM, uh, we, already, we already wrote one equation, but let's uh, calculate VOV. The drain current ID1 would be I over two. And this current would be I over two also. The MOSFETs should be in SAT. So ID, which is I over two, is half KW over LVGS minus VD squared. And in case I need VOV to calculate quantities like GM, this would, this would be the value of VOV, square root of I over K prime W over L. And we already showed that uh, the output will be VDD minus I over two times RD. And there's no, VCM does not appear anywhere here. The, the input does not appear anywhere in the output and the circuit is obviously rejecting the common mode input. Okay, so this is the case when the two inputs are equal. Now let's look at the case when the two inputs are not equal. So now at the first input, I will have some VG1, which is not equal to the second input, which is equal to VG2. I will apply some DC here. In general, I would need some DC maybe for biasing and plus VID over two. And at the second input, I will apply the same DC, but minus VID over two. So this is like the average and, and, and the difference that we talked about previously. So VI1 minus VI2 is VID because VI1 is the DC voltage plus VID over two while VI2 is the same DC voltage minus VID over two. So the difference is VID and the average, the common voltage between them is the DC voltage VDC here and same VDC here. What I want to show now is that the output would be some gain times VID. And, and then I can say that, okay, the circuit is amplifying the difference and I can consider it to be a successful differential amplifier. All right, so let's do, how do we show that the output is, um, some gain times VID. We'll have to do small signal analysis. And in small signal analysis, uh, we would 
set all the DC sources to zero. So here's the DC source, which becomes open in signal analysis. This becomes zero in signal analysis, so short to ground. Uh, VDC becomes zero, VDC becomes zero. The MOSFETs, I replace them by their small signal equivalent models. So small signal model for Q1, small signal model for Q2, RD stays and RD, RD and RD would be between the drain and signal ground. This will be an open circuit here. The, the, the first input would be just VID over two, just the signal component. The second input would be just minus VID over two. And um, if we do this, we draw the circuit and simplify it a bit, we get something like this. So this is now, this is VDD, now it's signal ground. This is the first MOSFET. This is the second MOSFET. This is the first gate, G1. This is the second gate, gate G2, which I am showing here also. The voltage at gate one is VID over two to ground. The voltage at gate two is minus VID over two to ground. And the difference between them is VID. So VID over two minus, minus VID over two is VID. The, out, the first output is at the drain of Q, Q1 or M1. And the second is at the drain of Q2 or M2. Notice that I used the T model for the MOSFETs in this case. Maybe the, the T model is a bit more convenient to use in this case than the uh, hybrid pi model. So this is the T model here for um, the first MOSFET. And I am not showing RO, I'm neglecting small RO. So on the T model, I will have GM VGS and the resistor one over GM between gate and source. Okay, so this is the source for the two MOSFETs. And here I have the current source I, which becomes zero, no signal, because it has no signal, it just becomes an open circuit. Okay, let me uh, erase just to keep the, the circuit simple. So here's a circuit and it's, what is it? I have a, a resistor and a current source, controlled current source, another resistor, and then a resistor, a controlled current source, and another resistor. So it's like a, like a single loop with two controlled resistors in it. VGS1, VG1 is a VID over two and VG2 is minus VID over two. Here's a question. What is the signal voltage at this node here? The node that's between the two sources where the two sources of the MOSFETs are connected. What is the signal voltage here? Uh, so what do we have? We have at the gate of G1, I have VID over two. And then a resistor. And then this node, I want to know the voltage here, the signal, what is the signal here? And then another resistor and minus VID over two. And this is the second gate. So this is the first gate. This is the second gate. And these two resistors are one over GM and one over GM because the two MOSFETs are biased at the same current and they have the same VOV. They will have the same GM. 
So I'll call one over GM, I'll call it small r for now, just small r is one over GM. And this will allow me to determine the voltage at this node. The current flowing like this would be the voltage at G1 minus the voltage at G2 divided by 2R. So this current is VID over 2 minus minus VID over 2. So VID divided by R plus R over 2R. The voltage at this node is therefore VID over 2 minus R times the current times VID over 2R. And if you simplify, you will get exactly zero. There is no signal here at this node. The signal at the node here in the middle is zero. And why is it zero? Because of the way the circuit is connected. It's not because I have a like a short ground or a DC voltage there, DC source. It's zero because of the way the circuit is connected. Because the two inputs are exactly, one of them is exactly VID over two and the other is exactly minus VID over two. We have what's called the seesaw effect. So what is the seesaw effect? So this is the first gate and this is the second gate. And this is the first resistor R. And this is the node in the middle. And this is the second resistor R. So R, R, and this is the node. And when G1 goes up by VID over two, G2 goes down by the exact same voltage minus VID over two. And therefore, if you look at the potential, the node in the middle would not move. If this goes up, if this is VID over two and minus VID over two, this is a sine wave. When this goes up, this goes down by the same amount, this wouldn't move. If this goes down, this would have to go up and then I'll have this situation and this node in the middle would not move. So as G1 and G2 move up and down, but they're always in opposite and equal directions, the node in the middle stays stationary at no signal. So here, there's no signal when G1 and G2 are uh, differential, exactly plus VID over two and minus VID over two. They're equal and moving in opposite directions. Due to the seesaw effect, this node in the middle becomes like, we call it a virtual ground. It's not ground, it's not shorted to ground. It's not forced to be a DC voltage. It's just that it doesn't move due to the structure of the circuit. So that's a virtual, that's a virtual ground at, at the two sources of the uh, MOSFETs. What if I have small RO and the current source is not ideal? Here, I assume that there is no small RO and that the current source is ideal here. Ideal I becomes an open circuit and I neglected small RO here. What if I don't want to neglect small RO and the ideal I is actually non-ideal? If I have a non-ideal I, what I would see is the output resistance, I will call this output resistance of the non-ideal source RSS. So now my circuit has an RSS, an RO here and an RO here. But the good news is that even if I have these ROs and I is non-ideal and has an output resistance RSS, we can still show that uh, this would still be at a virtual ground. So even if I have a small RO and I have an RSS, this node in the middle would still be at signal ground. 
So this, this is the slide I'm talking about. Considering the output resistance and considering small RO, the, uh, the uh, virtual ground node would not be affected. I would not see a signal there. It will still be at virtual ground. This would still be at virtual ground. So let's see how much, how much is the output? So VGS1, if this is at virtual ground, VGS1 would be VG1, which is VID over two minus zero. So that's VGS1. VGS2 would be VG2 minus VS2. VG2 is minus VID over two minus zero. So that's VGS2. And now I can find GM, VGS, and VO. VO, the voltage here for the first MOSFET, so that's VO1, would be minus, because the current is flowing in this direction, so flowing from ground up. So VO1 would be minus RD times this current, which is GM, VGS1. And that's equal to GM, VID over two. So that's VO1. VO2 would be the negative of that. So VO2 would be minus, minus, so plus GM VID over two times RD. So that's the second output. And of course, GM is ID over half VO V. So in this case, I over VO V. This uh, equation or these two equations are actually quite important because they show something very interesting. The output, whether at one or at two, at the first drain or at the second drain, is something times VID or something else times VID. This is the gain of this amplifier, and hopefully it will be much bigger than one. Not just that, I can also take the difference between the two outputs, VD2 minus VD1. So my output will be not at the drain to ground. My output can be between the two drains. So maybe I can, I can do this. I take VD2 minus VD1 and consider that to be my output. And in this case, I take the difference between them and I get VD2 minus VD1 equals GM VID RD. So I call this a differential output and the differential output will be the difference between the two outputs equal to GM RD times VID. So this is the second part that we needed to show. The first part was that if there's no VID, if there's no difference, I get no output and we did that. The second part, which we just finished now, was to show that if there is a difference, then the output would be some gain times this difference. And, 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 and this is what we're getting. Now, uh, in these differential amplifiers, I have two inputs and I have two outputs and I can take the output from wherever I want. So I can take the output from one, if it's convenient for me, I want just to consider, just consider we all want to be my output or VO2 or the difference or the difference this way, VO prime plus minus. It's up to us, it's up to, to you to say, okay, I, I want to take this as my output. If you take the output between drain and ground, this is called single ended output. If you take the output between the two drains, this is called differential output. And in general, this gain would be plus or minus because I can take VO or VO prime between the two drains. So if the output is single ended, depending on whether you take it at drain one or drain two, you get plus or minus one half GMRD as the gain. So if GM is one milli RD is 10K, you get a gain of plus or minus 
one half times 10, so plus or minus five. So that's gain. The output is five times bigger than the difference between the two inputs. If you take the output differentially between the two drains, you get double the gain. So you get GMRD or plus or plus or minus GMRD. So plus or minus 10. So when you take the output differentially, you get double the gain. And if you take VO or VO prime, you get plus or minus that. And again, the output is 10 times the difference. So that's great. So now we have the, the proof that this circuit, of course, with the right bias, with the right conditions, the MOSFETs have to be in saturation. And we don't, um, we apply a, a differential input. If this difference between the two inputs is VID, I will see an output. And depending on where I take my output, I will see uh, some gain times the difference or plus or minus or double that. When, when do I get double the gain? When I take the output differentially between the two drains, not between a drain and ground. So this is what we call the differential gain for this amplifier. We already talked about this, that if we consider the output resistance of the current source, RSS, it makes no difference because the node at the two MOSFET sources would still be at signal ground. And also if we consider small RO, uh, it will not affect the, uh, the equations much um, because the virtual ground is still, still appears here. And small RO would be like this. Small RO is always between drain and source. So it will appear like this. And this is virtual ground. So small RO is between output and virtual ground, but RD is between output and ground. So effectively RO and RD become in parallel. So here in the equation, whenever I have RD, if I need to consider small RO, the equation becomes plus or minus RD, GM RD parallel RO or plus or minus half GM RD parallel RO. Uh, 